Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for tuning in for another episode of the SEM Rush webinar. My name is Patrick, and I'm your host. Today is Tuesday, June 7th, and joining us is Ben Twitchell. Ben is the head of marketing at Mention, a leading media monitoring solution. He's also the former CEO of the Metropolitan Volt, a music publication that he grew from the ground up. He's an experienced full-stack marketer and a self-proclaimed SEO and lead generation ninja. He's been gracious enough to join us today to discuss the SEO tactics and hacks that he used to increase organic traffic by 373% in six weeks. Those are some impressive results. Uh, but before we dive into the presentation, I just want to review a few things. The webinar is being recorded, and we will make it available at youtube.com slash SEMrushHQ. Also, the slide deck will be made available uh, later on, and we will be doing a Q&A session at the end of the webinar. Just put your questions for Ben in the GoToWebinar box, and we'll get to as many of those as we can. Uh, don't be shy about it. Don't wait until the end of the presentation. Feel free to put them in throughout. You can also follow us along on Twitter with the hashtag SEMRushLive or tweet us at mention or at SEMRush. Ben, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thank you for the kind, word, pa kind words, Patrick. I'm uh, very excited to be here and uh, presenting my tactics. So uh, I just want to uh, say hi to everybody. We've had a, a great response to the webinar. I'm super excited. So I'm going to jump right into it. Uh, as Patrick said, today we're going to be talking about the tactics and hacks I use to increase organic traffic by 373 uh, percent in six weeks only to uh, mention.com. So first, before we get all the way started, I just want to talk to you guys about the promise. You know, um, I'm not going to claim I'm an SEO expert, and that's not because uh, the tactics in here don't work. It's because I, I don't like the term, but instead today what I promise you is I will be uh, presenting the findings that I have uh, collected and the tactics I have used to create these great results so that you can use them in your own experiments and in your own work and make the most of them. And then also what you'll be learning today is twofold. Uh, the keywords, uh, the strategy, the keyword strategy, uh, how to determine a great keyword strategy, and then also technical fixes that you can do on your own website to leverage uh, search engine traffic to generate revenue. Now, you might say six weeks, you know, how is that even possible? And it's really all about getting a good keyword strategy and leveraging what you've already had. So what I had at mention was a high domain authority website with quality backlinks, good traffic, and a proven sales model. There was very little done for SEO, and I had full authority to change the code, the copy of the pages, and create new pages. This is essentially a search engine optimization gold mine. Now, if you don't have this situation, you know, is this webinar and are these tactics still for you? Frankly, they absolutely are. You know, you might not see a 370% uh, increase or 50,000 ARR in six weeks, but all of these tactics will advance and speed up your search engine results. So quickly, I want to show you guys some data. I would love to show you some graphs here, but I'm saving those for the case study uh, that will follow these. Uh, when, when I started, we were getting around 1,000 to 1,200 average new users from search and now we're getting 7,100 organic per week, uh, and this is after just one week. Um, so quickly, uh, let's move over and let's get started. Uh, this will be a two-step presentation uh, with a shorter one step uh, and then a larger step two. Um, so first is going to be how to select the keywords that you're going to do your technical fixes around. Okay? There's three main things here. First is volume. Uh, volume is very important here. Uh, you want to essentially have the highest amount of volume per keyword you can. Now, there are some exceptions to this rule. Um, first of all, uh, high volume words are higher difficulty. I'll get that in, into that in a minute. And second of all, you should also consider trying to rank for lower volume words when they match your product perfectly. These long tail keywords typically represent 
uh, when someone is ready to buy. Now let's move into difficulty. Uh, this is essentially how competitive a keyword is. Uh, when looking at difficulty, you want to ask yourself, what resources do I have? Uh, how, how much domain authority do I have? What do I stand to gain from ranking on this keyword? Now, the third point here is really the most important. You know, is a potential customer going to search this keyword? This is very quickly forgotten, and it's one of the biggest mistakes I see in a keyword strategy. Let me give you an example. Imagine you have a product around social uh, networks, and you want to prevent people from hacking social networks. And you see the term social hacks, quote, social hacks, has low difficulty and some search volume, and you want to optimize around this term. The problem with this is the term hacks has become common slang for skills or techniques, and people searching for social hacks are probably looking for tips for meeting people or possibly ways to improve their social media presence. But unfortunately for you, it's very unlikely they're trying to prevent hackers, and thus very unlikely they will buy your product. Even further, uh, users who come to your page from this term not only will not stay on your page and not buy your, your product, but they will, in fact, leave quickly, and this will lower the ranking of your page almost right away. Now, to determine these, what do you want, what tools should you use? Um, SEMrush is great for determining volume and difficulty, and this really is not a plug for SEMrush as I'm doing the webinar. Uh, I want to do this webinar as I'm a big fan of SEMrush, so definitely check out the tool. Another couple of good tools for volume and difficulty is the Google Keyword Planner typically a paid ad tool, but you don't actually need to be running paid campaigns to get volume numbers from the Google Keyword Planner. I would definitely check it out. Also, Google Trends is great. It'll allow you to see if a keyword is being searched more or less frequently over time. And then to determine if a term is something that people are searching who will buy your product, just simply search it in Google Now and see what is ranking currently. It's a great way to determine are people searching this term to, that are looking for your product. Now, before I move to the technical fixes, I want to show you guys a quick trick on how to find, thanks to the Google Search Console, what your pages are already ranking for. While this is a well-documented trick online, I find not a lot of people use it and put it to use as they should. So, first of all, you want to access your Google Search Console console. Some people refer to this as the web uh, master tools. You'll see on the left a, tra a tab called search traffic and then under that you want to go to search analytics. From there you click on pages in the top. You'll see it boxed here and then you see on the bottom all your various pages. Click on the page you want to go to and you'll have your data filtered by page. It'll look like this. Then simply click queries on the left and then you'll see it top right, excuse me, top left, the queries is selected, and down in the bottom here, you'll actually see what people are searching in Google to land on this page. Now, I found this data is not perfect in, the term, in terms of number of clicks, but it gives you a really, really good idea of what people are searching for and how they're landing on your page, and this is a great way to re-optimize content, pick new keywords to target, um, and really focus on some data around getting a sense for what people are searching. And the last step here is just making sure that clicks, impressions, and position is turned on so you can see all the data. Next, we're going to move into the larger part of the presentation. This is the technical fixes section. Now, before I jump into this section, I really want to make very, very clear that SEO and user experience must be balanced. And in fact, I don't think balance is even the right term. User experience always should trump SEO. So take these techniques, put them to use, but do not ruin your user experience for higher SEO traffic. Okay, now let's move into the first strategy here, which is take advantage of your navigation bar. Okay, your keywords should be found in your navigation bar. No question, you got to words, 
in the navigation bar and not only will it rank these pages higher automatically, it will also associate these terms to your domain. Secondarily, it maximizes internal linking. As most navigations are present on every website, uh, throughout every page on the website, these pages will be linked to more. The more you link to a page, the more Google thinks that you find it important and thus it will rank better. Let's see how this works for me. The top slide here, uh, you'll see it looks very repetitive. The top slide here is when I arrived at Mention, what it looked like, and the second slide is what we've done. So you'll see the big difference here is we now have a media monitoring tab with words below it, and these are all landing pages, and these are actually our target keywords. And you know, one of the reasons I'm willing to show these to you is that any good SEO website, you'll be able to figure out some of their main keywords just by looking at their navigation bar. So this is a great segue to my next point, which is maximizing internal links. Okay? People talk about backlinks all the time, endlessly. And this makes sense because backlinks are really important, and you definitely don't want to forget your backlinks, but don't underestimate the power of internal links. And this is because backlinks take a massive amount of time, they take a lot of resources, and while they're really important, you don't have control over them like you have control over your internal links. So there's three main reasons why I find internal links important. As I just said, you have full control over all of them. They allow you to tell, and the second reason is they allow you to tell Google which pages are most important. And then third, they allow you to associate terms to those pages that may not be your exact keywords but related synonyms and other keywords. And then also what you want to do with your internal links is make sure you're using proper anchor text. And this applies to backlinks on other websites as well as your own. You'll see an example here. This is a screenshot of the mentioned website. We have an internal link here on the bottom where it says learn more about media monitoring. You'll see that we link the term media monitoring and this obviously links to our media monitoring page. I see all around the internet people having links like learn more about your media monitoring comma here and they link here. This is not a good practice. It associates the word here to your media monitoring page when really you want Google to associate the word media monitoring. Next up is URL structure. You absolutely want to focus on a very strong URL structure. This is a major player in how Google reads your page. The, you really want to make sure that the keyword is in the URL and you want to have it separated by hyphens. Hyphens are what Google reads as spaces. This is true not only for URLs, but also image files. Always use hyphens when you want a space. Google will read it as a space. Now, also, you want to make sure that your subpages are listed as subdirectories. You'll see some examples here where our media monitoring page is slash media dash monitoring, uh, just as I said with a hyphen, and then our social media monitoring page is a subpage, uh, excuse me, a subdirectory of that page. Uh, this allows us to have both keywords associated with that page, and it's a specifically good example here because, fortunately for us, Media monitoring is both a keyword for the term media monitoring and then also social media monitoring. However, if that is not the case, it is still valuable to do this. And if you're using WordPress, like many of the internet, I believe it's 57%, don't quote me on that exact number, uses uh, WordPress, it's very, very easy to do this. You simply need to make the page a child page. So for this example, our social media monitoring page is a child page of the media monitoring page and WordPress is smart enough to make an automatic redirect. This means mention.com slash en slash social media marketing will automatically redirect to this URL that you're seeing here, so that means you don't lose any traffic. And also, if you have the page already there and you want to make it a child page, the redirect will be set for you right away. Next, I want to move to heading tags. This is a key, key, key player to any SEO strategy. Now, there's really two main parts here. You want to make sure, first of all, that you're not using a proper, excuse me, an improper hierarchical structure. 
but then you want to make sure that you're only using your header tags for keywords. Okay, let's jump into step one right now. Okay, step one is to make sure that you're using a descending hierarchical order without skipping. Okay, this is fairly hard to articulate, so bear with me as I walk through the examples here. You want to make sure that you go down in number and you hit the number before you go back up, but as long as you hit the number and then return higher, it's appropriate and okay to descend again. Now let's go through a couple examples of where uh, there's a proper hierarchy, hierarchy structure and an improper hierarchy structure. You'll see here H1, H2, H3, H2, H4. Now this is okay because after you went, first of all you went in a descending order one, two, three, and then we returned back up to two, and then it's appropriate for us to go back down to four because we've already reached three. Okay, this you'll see here that one, two, two, three works. One, two, three, two, two works. And I'm only going to four here, but this continues onwards to five or six, etc. Now let's go over some important examples of what does not work. Okay, one, three, two, three. You'll see here that you're skipping two right off the bat. This is a broken heading structure. You do not want to do this. Another example of this is H1, H2, H2, H4, H3. And you'll see here again that you're skipping H3. You really want to go in order. And one little aside I want to make here is if I've lost you when I'm talking about headers and you think I'm not a developer, why am I looking at code right now? Anyone who wants to be worth their salt in HTML needs to have a basic understanding, uh, excuse me, not of HTML, but of search engine optimization. If you want to be worth your salt in search engine optimization, it is vital to have at least a rudimentary understanding of HTML and CSS. Now, I'm not a developer. I cannot code. I would never dare develop a page for mention. But it's vital for me to understand heading structures, to understand style sheets, at least the basics. Now, Again, if I lost you here, start Googling, start learning. Code Academy is a great free resource to start learning. Okay, let's move to step two. And this is where you're going to start using your headers only strategically for search purposes. All right, when I first came to mention, there were many headers on the page that didn't have key terms in them for search. Now this is normal because most search terms are used purely for stylistic purposes. This is why uh, headers were created. They were created so that the coder could easily have consistent style throughout the page. Now you'll see here, this is a screenshot of an area we have frequently on the website. Uh, it says 500,000 companies are already using mention every day. That's great. We want to keep it in this large font. We want to keep it consistent. This is how an H2 is styled for us. However, there are no keywords in this, in this area. None of these words are words we want to rank for. Does that mean we have to have it as a header? No, absolutely not. We can easily create another class in our style sheet, make this a P or normal text, and associate this new class, which is styled exactly like a header, to this text. Now let's take a look at that. You'll see here, and it's the highlighted in gray area, P and then class equals, and you'll see the name of the class and then the text. This was previously a header too, but now it's simply a P, which means Google is putting the proper weight on this, meaning it's not considering it a header, but the text still looks exactly what, like we want it to look. This is a great trick not to sacrifice user experience, but to maximize SEO. Now, just to quickly review, you want to make sure your headers are in proper descending order, and you want to make sure you're only using headers when there is an opportunity to place a keyword. Next, let's move to redirects. Everyone knows redirects are not good for SEO. Some are much worse than others. Now, 
unless you have a temporary redirect where it's a situation where there's a construction page or something like that, you always, always, always want to use a 301 redirect. By using them, you tell Google that page A is replaced by page B. This will pass all of the link juice from the original page to page the new page. This means any backlinks you have on the original page will get pushed along. Now, this is also extremely important for multilingual websites. Uh, Mention, for example, has websites in several languages, and unfortunately for us, we have to set up a redirect every single time someone comes to the website to make sure they go to the proper language. Now, we were originally using 302 redirects all across the website, which means we had a big, big penalty for SEO. So simply by switching universally all of our 302 redirects, 301 redirects, we were able to see a massive boost in SEO traffic. Next up, I want to talk about duplicate content. I get asked all the time questions like, hey, if I get my blog post syndicated, will I get a duplicate traffic punishment? Now, this is an important question, but oftentimes when I take a look at this person's website, they have their pre-prod environment public and live on the internet. Now, this isn't to say anyone could access it. You'd need to know a secret URL, but Google crawls the entire internet. If you don't tell it not to crawl these pages, it will see these pages, and any good pre-prod environment has the exact same content as the development environment. This was the case it mentioned. So what we did is we put a password protect on our pre-prod. This prevents Google from crawling it, but however, there are many ways to do this. If you want your pre-prod environment to be public, which is not a great practice, but it's your website, you can go through the HTT access file, or you can prevent it from being crawled in the robots.txt file. Next up, there is a uh, important thing to do with multilingual websites. Uh, this is especially important for mention because you know we are also a multilingual website. Uh, you want to declare your language. Even if you only have an English or a French or a German website, good practice, tell Google what language it's in. Now, this was especially important for us because while the pages were translated in other languages, some of our keywords were the same. There's no good way to translate media monitoring or social media tracking in French. So while all of the text was in French, the main headers were still in essentially the English terms. So before we declared what languages these pages were in, Google was again hitting us not only for our pre-prod environment, but for our duplicate content thanks to our multiple languages. Now, uh, working towards the end here, it's really hard in general to get a sense for how much money are you selling thanks to search engine traffic. Okay. I don't want to go too deep into this, but the way that I like to do it is to have a lead management system that can associate the origin of that lead and the plan or MRR of that lead. Now, as a marketer, I naturally chose HubSpot. Uh, as a, excuse me, as a content marketer, I naturally chose HubSpot. And what we did is we pushed uh, all of our contacts, uh, or paying contacts and leads to HubSpot. HubSpot automatically detected search origin, and then we connected our MRR and our plan data, and we were able to see how many plans we have sold. And while, as mentioned, sells very expensive enterprise plans as well as solo and uh, starter group plans, it's very important for us to see what type of plans we're selling from what type of traffic. Okay, now let's take a quick review here. All right, I ran through this a bit quickly, so let's jump into the review and make sure we got everything nailed down. First, and most importantly, is to jump into the keyword strategy before the technical fixes. Make sure your keywords have enough volume. Make sure that the difficulty is correlated to the resources you can provide, the domain authority you have, and your long-term SEO goals. And then never forget to ask yourself, are potential customers searching for this keyword. Not only is it important for your overall ranking, but it's vital to make sure your SEO traffic turns into dollars. And that's the whole point. 
Do we care about traffic or do we care about sales? Now, once you've nailed down the keywords, you want to move over to the technical fixes. Now, the first thing to do is to take advantage of your navigation bar. Make sure the search terms are in there. Make sure that those search terms are connected to your keywords. And make sure that then from there, you're maximizing internal links. Make sure they're everywhere that is logical without sacrificing user experience. And make sure you're not linking words like here, but the term itself. Next, you want to make sure that the page names and the, the excuse me, the terms are in the URL structure and you're using a proper subdirectory structure. Next, you want to make sure that you're properly using your header tags. And this is twofold. You want to make sure that you're not incorrectly using a hierarchy where you're skipping terms, but then you want to make sure that you're maximizing your real estate. Only use header tags when you are trying to indicate to Google that this is a term you want the page to rank for. It's all about how easily Google can read your page. If you make it very easy for Google to read what you want it to rank for, you'll, you'll have a lot easier of a time ranking for that. Next up, you want to make sure that you're using the proper redirects. Use 301 redirects, not 302. Of course, if it's a temporary redirect, uh, you want to use a 302, which is temporary, but if you're never going to change it, use a 301 to be able to pass the link choose. Watch out for duplicate content and not only watch out for it across the web, make sure to watch out for it in your own house, across multiple languages, across your pre-prod environment, make sure you're not duplicating your content. Next, we'll declare your language, especially if you're a multilingual website, but also it's just a good practice, declare it in the language that it's in, even if it's only in one language. And then lastly, and really frankly, almost most importantly, make sure to have a, a lead tracking system which associates the MRR and the plan that you're selling to those leads. Now I want to thank everyone for their attention. I know that was a lot of material. I know I ran through it quickly, so I'm really excited for your questions. Uh, I'm here for you. Ben, thanks so much. That was excellent, and we do have plenty of questions coming in. All right, so this one's kind of specific. If, if your keyword is something to the effect of uh, cures for bad breath, should you include uh, the connector words, all the small words like for and uh, in the, the URL structure, or is it better to omit the smaller words and just stick to the ones you actually want to focus on? Well, I think the, the answer to this question here lies into what I was saying around volume and difficulty. Uh, you want to make sure that it's connected to the difficulty and it's connected to the volume. If the small words uh, have a higher volume and a higher difficulty, definitely leave them in there. But we also have to realize here that Google is very smart. Google has an algorithm. What they do when someone searches is they try to determine what that person is searching for. And people have different search habits. If some people write a full question. Some people write a full sentence. Some people put the keywords in there. So if you're doing a good job with your keywords uh, in the sense of not only using one keyword repetitively throughout, but changing it up so there's a semantic universe, Google will be able to tell that not only is, and remind me what the word was, it's cures for bad breath, not only the search bad breath or cure bad breath, but also cures for bad breath will land on this page. Meaning, you know, you have three or four headers on this page, use the variations in these different headers to make sure you're hitting it. Make sure that in one of the headers you have cures for bad breath in there and make sure in another one of the header you have a variation and one variation should be without the small words and another variation should be a synonym of, of cure, perhaps the word remedy. Excellent answer. Uh, this next one is regarding uh, some of the tools that you like to use. Uh, which what tool or tools uh, do you like to use to identify the SEO content of a page, uh, header tags, et cetera, versus digging manually into the source code? Frankly, I, I like to dig in manually. I, I don't think it's very hard uh, without a tool to determine what someone is doing. And I imagine this is someone who's curious about their competitor's SEO. And as I said earlier, Typically, the main keywords someone will be ranking for are pretty obvious. They'll be in the navigation, they'll be in the URL, 
and they'll be in the headers. So if you wanted to do this on a massive scale, I suppose you could try to find a tool to do it. But in my experience, uh, as I target very specific competitors and I try to outrank them, I'll just go to their page. I'll, I'll inspect the elements and I'll use the source code. Great. Uh, and um, let's see here. How, do you have any advice on uh, how you would handle geolocated home pages in terms of the, the redirects and, and SEO best practices? Well, local SEO is a, is a big subject these days. Uh, frankly, uh, if, if you're worried about local SEO, I would be worried about things not really pertaining to redirects. I would be more worried about making sure you have a registered business in that area. Uh, that's a trick that people do all the time. Um, something that I would do is if you don't have a registered business in that area, you can get a mail service that will accept mail at that address and then register that address as uh, one of your addresses for your business. This will allow you to uh, get the postcard that Google sends you to verify your address and then you will rank better for that local search. I know that this isn't an exact answer to, to the question for, for redirects, I want to acknowledge that, but before uh, you worry about redirects, make sure that you have a local address before you hone in on local SEO. And would you recommend, uh, of course, through Google, but are there uh, certain business review sites that you would recommend uh, registering for as well, such as Yelp or uh, things like that, in order to uh, refine your geolocation? For search, uh, no, I wouldn't. Um, I think it's very important to get you know, leads and brand awareness from things like Yelp, um, but I don't think, uh, and I haven't done a lot of research into this, so you know, definitely double check my answer here, but it's more important to have your personal address registered with Google than it is to have things registered with Yelp. However, if you have a location in that area, it's only logical to register it with Yelp and to be getting a general brand awareness. If you don't have the brand awareness, you're not going to build the backlinks. And without the backlinks, you're not going to have any SEO ranking whatsoever. Sounds like a plan. Uh, let's see here. We've got a couple of other questions about the redirects. Um, okay, so this one, uh, in terms of internal linking, what about um, the penalty of overusing internal links the same way external links are penalized. Is, is that cause for concern? Uh, should you be using them sparingly or is, is this something that today you shouldn't worry about? I think this goes back to, to the point where I was saying don't sacrifice user experience for SEO. You know, if you're, if you're watching this webinar to try to make a, a 90s SEO strategy with PPC ads, um, you know, this is not the webinar for you. This, this is all about uh, maximizing the search traffic of a website that's front-facing and sells a product. Now, if you're selling a product and you want to make sure you have a good user experience, it's nearly impossible to add so many internal links uh, that Google will penalize you before breaking your user experience. So if your user experience is put in mind first, then I wouldn't worry about over internal linking. Uh, for example, you know, I have certain pages where I have more than 100 or even 200 internal links. Keep in mind, you know, Mention is a big website, but there's no penalty for those as if they're placed logically, I'm not spamming the user. If it seems legit to you, I wouldn't worry about it. Now, if you're asking that question because you're already pushing the limits and you think you might be pushing it too far, you probably are. Definitely. Uh, this one, this next question here, I apologize, that there's a lot rolling in just right now. Um, in terms of monitoring your leads that you're generating, uh, let's see here, if, if you don't have paying subscribers for your site, um, how much uh, stock do you put in tracking conversions uh, such as a form filled out or, or a class registration based upon uh, organic search results? Is, um, 
Is so, that something? To answer this question, I really need to ask a question to the uh, question them themselves. I don't know if they can do a follow-up question to you, but you know, what, what's the point of search engine traffic to a website that doesn't sell anything? Uh, you know, if, if you have a personal traffic and you're trying to grow a personal blog, um, that's great. Use all these tactics. You know, grow your brand. Um, but if you're a business, you, you should be selling things on your website. And and if you're not selling things directly on your website, you should be generating leads. Uh, and then you can easily associate these leads to not only the search side that you're coming from, but then also even if you're not selling online. Uh, through your CRM, through whatever your sales team is using and your business development is using, you can then associate uh, which leads came from search and how much money those leads made. But to go back to the original question, I'm, uh, I'm really confused why someone would want to have uh, a website that doesn't sell anything but also track individuals. So we got a, a follow-up reply on that one. It looks like uh they're doing an educational offering, uh, and they're they're mostly focusing in on tracking keywords uh, through analytics. So more more of an introductory uh, SEO level question on that one. Okay, so I suppose here, if you're doing an education, you really want to track engagement. So for me, you know, if I if I'm educating people and I want to see that people are responding to my course, as opposed to tracking sales, it's it's still really important to track engagement. So what you want to do is set up a lead management system, and then in that system you want to track whatever KPIs you find important to determine either if they're highly engaged or if you have another uh, metric that you think is valuable, and then see, you know, are people who are coming from search the ones who are high quality based on the metrics that you determine, or are they low quality? And this will then allow you to determine is it valuable for me to be pouring more money into my SEO strategy? Should I be rolling back? Should I be maintaining? Definitely good questions to consider at that point. Uh, we've got, let's see here. Uh, can you elaborate a bit on your point of tracking origin and, MM, and MRR? Uh, I believe you're referring to uh, monthly revenue. Um, yeah. Um, so. Just to give a specific example here, uh, because I'm not exactly clear on what they're looking for, I'll, I'll just extrapolate on what we do. Um, HubSpot, which is our lead management system, tracks origin source automatically. Uh, just whenever we have a new lead coming in, uh, and this is from either a demo sign up, a paid sign up, uh, uh, any sort of contact, like for example, registering for a webinar, downloading an ebook, HubSpot will automatically determine. Did they come from email marketing? Did they come from search? Did they come from paid? Did, was it direct traffic? So that's already determined. Okay? And then I will have lots of other abilities to have contact properties. And these contact properties can be uh, user input like name, email address, things like that. And then they can also be contact properties where your system generates and inputs the proper value. So. associate the plan type because we have several different plans here at mentioned and then I also associate the MRR and this allows me to not only assess the value of the search traffic that we have but it also allows me to analyze how valuable is search versus paid you know per dollar I spend on search am I make how much money am I making per dollar on paid how much money am I making per uh, direct traffic or email uh, marketing how, how much, uh, how many plans are, are coming in, how many users are coming in, and this allows me to properly address uh, the question of where to allocate my resources. And in terms of this specific campaign uh, that uh, you put together the case study for, we had a couple of questions about that. Specifically, uh, were any of the techniques that you introduced uh, put into place prior to uh, the six weeks uh, being measured? No. So, just to bring a little clarity what happened, um, at six weeks I, I started this project. Uh, absolutely uh, nothing that I discussed today was in place. So it's not something that was happening for a long time and I started measuring. None of the techniques I talked about were there. We did all these techniques and then I forced a Google recrawl. 
This is something else you can do through the Google Search Console. It's the same tool I talked about uh, using to see where your queries are coming from. If you want to get serious about SEO, important to learn about the Google Search Console. So what I did is I created a lot of these changes, I created a lot of these pages over the course of six weeks. Okay? Most of them got pushed at different points, but I made sure everything was up at around the five, six week mark, and then I forced recrawls the page, which basically, to, what that does is it tells Google, all right, make sure you have everything, read the page again, put it in your system. Okay, and, and you know, this is smart to do, you have a maximum amount, but it's so high that I would never worry about it. And this is smart to do whenever you release an update, whenever you release a blog post, you might want to be doing this. Okay? And then almost instantly, a couple days after the recrawl, we saw the traffic go up and up and up, and it never went down again. And uh, let's see here. There was two other questions. Where was the initial traffic coming from for the site before you launched into the campaign? Like the main source. The main source of traffic? Mm -hmm. uh, the main two sources of traffic were mentioned were uh, direct traffic, and this is thanks to uh, word of mouth. We had great branding. Uh, and then it was also uh, thanks to referral traffic. Uh, this is from uh, things like directories, like you mentioned before, news articles, uh, partnerships we have that, that link to us, uh, just being linked to around the web. Um, you know, and then, of course, we had some traffic as well from social. And all right, so switching gears a little bit here, uh, could you go into uh, more detail on the specifics of uh, volume versus difficulty? Specifically, one of our uh, audience members want to know if there's a sweet spot to look for or do you consider that something that's very situational depending on the campaign that you're running? So I, I consider it very situational not necessarily because of the campaign but mostly because of the website. You know any website is going to have a, a different ability to rank. Uh, for example with mention I had the ability to target high level uh, difficulty words and you know, as I said before high difficulty terms and phrases and keywords uh, typically uh, are the good ones you know people have been doing SEO for a while now they, they notice uh, this term has a lot of volume people are searching this term I want to rank for this term especially uh, you know terms that businesses are targeting so at least on the on the difficulty side it, to it totally depends how much ability do you have? Not only as a domain name, you know, how many backlinks do you have? What's your current domain authority? But also, how much budget do you have? Do you have enough budget to hire content writers pages? Do you have enough budget to create these pages? Um, so the difficulty is a question of one, where you rank now, um, and then two, how much resources can you attribute? So to give you a little bit more of a specific answer, if you have both of those, a high domain authority and uh, a high uh, amount of resources, shoot for the moon. You know, rank for those high keywords. Uh, beat out your competitors. It's possible. Now, if you have a low domain authority and a not a lot of resources, you want to spend more time doing research and finding those killer keywords that can become your money makers. Keywords that you know, people might not have realized have good, good volume and have only low or medium difficulty. Um, and then moving over to, to volume, um, I want to reiterate something I said before is while more is typically better, you do not want to forget about long tail keywords. And long tail keywords refers to when it's a specific keyword that has very low volume, but the keyword is perfect for your business or, or your sales pitch. and Essentially, if someone uses this keyword, uh, if it's a good long tail keyword for you, they will come to your page and they will buy your product. So even if something has uh, half or even 10% of the amount of volume, if it has 10 times or, or 20 times the conversion rate, it's more valuable. So short answer is it's really, really situational, unfortunately. And that's often the case with digital marketing efforts. Uh, these next few questions we have here are uh, regarding uh, tagging. Uh, so the first one here is uh, how does the, the sequence of H1, H2, uh, and so forth influence 
uh, rankings. Can I ask this person to follow up with, when they say sequence, are they talking about the order or are they talking about the number in terms of how does H1 have value versus H2 or is it more about how does the order affect? Let's see here. So Tom, if you're still with us, if you could follow up on that. And we're just going to jump around here because we've got several other questions while we're waiting on that. Um, should uh, image alt tags exactly mirror keyword uh, H tags or B synonyms? I would say so. Um, alt tags definitely give you some ranking ability. Now, they're not very strong. So, what I say here is, you know, if you have a website that's already created and you have lots of images up, it's not worth your time to go back and change all of them. Now, if you're adding new images and you want to create some guidelines, Absolutely, uh, make sure to include, include the keyword or synonym. Um, and something I'm about to say here relates to not just alt tags, but anything. When you are doing your uh, header tags, uh, your keyword strategy, always use synonyms. You always, always, always want to create what's called a semantic universe. If you use the same term over and over and over again in all of your H tags and throughout your text, Google will realize what you're doing. They know you're trying to game the system. But if you use synonyms uh, and you use uh, related terms, uh, even if it's not synonyms, uh, it will not only uh, allow you to rank for more keywords, it will improve the ranking of your main keyword. And this can get very different. Uh, you can go anywhere from uh, social media tracking to what people are saying about me online. Now that's an extreme example, but if you boil down the meaning of those, they mean very similar things even though none of the words are the same. And I would encourage people to maybe not get that far apart, but you definitely want to have some variance in your keywords with both synonyms um, and uh, the semantic universe. Excellent advice. Uh, we did have a follow-up from uh, the, the prior question. Uh, he said that the, with the presentation earlier, uh, perhaps the uh, order H1 followed by H3 might not be a good practice uh, in that order on the, the same page. It, is that the case or is that something that you shouldn't have cause for concern? No, that is absolutely the case. You do not want to have an H1 followed by an H3. You want to have them in sequence. Now, uh, there are some situations where you can skip but that's only when you've already hit the number. Uh, for example, say you have H1, H2, H3, then you could have an H2, and then you could skip to H4 if you wanted. But that's only because you have systematically descended already. You never want to skip without naming in order each alt, excuse me, each header tag. So we, we have another user here asking, uh, with Weebly, that they only have a built-in option for H2s. Uh, would using those without using the H1s be detrimental? So I imagine with Weebly, uh, I don't know Weebly specifically, but I imagine whatever your page title is is going to be automatically the H1. Um, if you do not have the ability to have an H1 on Weebly, I'm going to tell you right now, if you care about your search traffic, change. You need to have an H1, you want to have it be only one, and you want to have it be your page title. Um, I would be very shocked if Weebly didn't have that practice built in, um, but I imagine it's the title is the H1 and then all of the subsequent are H2. Great. Uh, we, we only have time for a couple more questions here, uh, so let's see. In terms of backlinks, uh, so we, we've had a few questions about those. Um, more for, for starters, so um, if you're a startup without much exposure, uh, what, what are, is some general advice for uh, getting people to link to you? Where, where should uh, you be seeking those out and, and what are some best practices there? So 
first off, uh, you want to be making personal relationships. Uh, and this is not only for your SEO strategy, but this is just for any new startup. Personal relationships are gold. Uh, not only do they help you with uh, getting backlinks, they help you with uh, getting partnerships. Uh, personally, I can say partnerships are a gold mine for lead generation here at Mention. And we're not a new startup. We're, we're, we're four years running. And it was just as important in the beginning as it is now. Okay. So first off, for getting backlinks, you want to generate uh, relationships with people. You want to generate partners. Uh, these people will naturally link to you, uh, and you will link back to them. Uh, the second thing you want to do is you want to create uh, high-value content that is linkable. Um, this meaning uh, if you write about a product launch only, or you write about uh, new features, or you write about how you have Friday beers with your team every week, nobody cares. Nobody's going to link to this. I mean, maybe your customers like the update, but no one's going to link to this. If you are a new com company, say you're, uh, I don't know, here's a random example, a window cleaning service, okay? You want to write a blog post around, here's how uh, the best techniques for cleaning windows. And some people are averse to this because they think people will steal their business, things like that, but if you create high valuable resources and then promote them, people will link to it. All right, let's see here. Uh, how do you feel, uh, okay, for a designer, um, how do you feel about linking back to your main site uh, from, from the sites that you've designed? Uh, two of the, the considerations there were if there's a varied portfolio, uh, is there any cause for concern in terms of uh, the content, and is it better to have no follow links at that point or not? In your opinion, I'm not sure if I understand the the question. Let me just make sure I understand. It's if you are a designer and you have a personal website and you want to link to all of the websites you designed. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Um, in terms of your own website on your portfolio, uh, external links uh, are not going to hurt you. Uh, people worry about external links a lot. I don't put a big concern on them. Uh, I wouldn't worry about that at all. Um, in terms of hurting the SEO of the pages which you have designed, uh, the only way an inbound link could do this is if Google has determined that your portfolio website is spam and it's something nasty on the web, and I highly doubt this. Uh, so my answer is no, uh, you can make them follow links. Um, but the one other side note is unless you're a, a super famous developer or you're a developer with, with a lot of content on your website that is ranking well, your personal uh, design website is most likely not going to rank well. So these links uh, to these other pages are not going to have uh, a big impact. And, and that's not to say it's impossible. That's just to say, you know, standard, uh, on average, portfolio websites don't have a lot of... Uh, linking and backlink power. So uh, are there any negative ramifications of reciprocal links if you and a partner uh, both link back to one another? Uh, should you be reviewing their website uh, thoroughly if, if it's a business connection before doing so? No. Uh, I mean, you should take a look at the website. You should make sure it's not obviously spam. Uh, these are the type of things that people worry about often, and I, and I always tell people to take a take a bit of a deep breath with this. Um, you know, you can you can use SEO tools like uh, SEM Rush or Moz or really many tools to see if it has a spam score. If you're really worried, you can check if the website has a spam score. But most people who've used the internet for a few years can tell what is a real website and what is not. And as long as you don't get excessive with the amount of links back and forth, uh, I wouldn't worry about it. Excellent. Well, Ben, thank you so much again for your time today. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us. I hope that you learned something from it. Uh, if we didn't get to quite all of your questions, uh, we will be following up with some of you. Um, and keep an eye out for uh, email regarding the, the SEM Rush trial. Ben will be uh, reaching out from Mention as well uh, in regards to 
the, the case study and some more information. And I hope you all have a wonderful evening. Check back on semrush.com slash webinars uh, for more information on all of our upcoming presentations with our free educational series. Have a wonderful evening, everyone.